how often do you write jokes? You know what? All the time. You're, you know, you're out with buddies or you're around the house, your kids do some. I'm a one-liner guy, so I always, if something happens, you just, you know, you write, oh, that's funny. You know, you crank it up. Oh, that's hilarious. For instance, I'll tell you, let me show you. Out to dinner yesterday. <laughs> We're out at dinner yesterday. I said, I gotta remember that. I'm a fan of Peyton Manning. Right. I always give Peyton Manning a hard time. Whenever I see him, I could go Big Red because he never beat Nebraska. That's pretty cool. So uh, he got an award at the dinner and the joke was popped out. Wow, look at Peyton Manning. You could play the sizzle reel on his forehead. <laughs> that's a funny joke. I, I hope Peyton would think that's funny. <laughs> um, I was watching TV a uh, couple of days ago and there's the deal-dot-com commercial where you can bid on items and get them cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I just came up with, you know, I got my wife, I can just picture this guy coming on going, I got my wife a 1700 pair of fake boobs for $14 on deal-dot-com. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny, so I wrote it down. I, so I just come up with goofy stuff and I write them down and then I incorporate them in my act. I have a crazy, you know, there's a couple other comedians. Seinfeld does it like this, and I, I knew there was a couple other comedians that did like this, but I'm a baseball fan. So I have my act. That's the major leagues. Right. That is my act. I'm all one liner. So in my act, there's probably anywhere from in an hour and 15 minute act, there's probably between 270 and 310 punchlines, depending on which way I'm doing my act or how many minutes, I'm, if I'm doing an hour 12, an hour 15, an hour 10. Right. So punchlines, because I'm a one line of guy. Right. Which is much different from an, uh, a typical comedian. It's a different a, a kind of act. Story. There's observational, right. there's political observational, there's props, there's uh, 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 physical, and I'm, uh, I'm a one line of guy. So that's why I write, so I have those jokes, those are the major league jokes. And then I have pages and pages and pages of one-liners. And so I have triple A, double A, and single A. Single A would be these. Okay. They were just born. They were just born this week. That's single A. Um, triple A has been to the big dance, and uh, I just haven't used them in, uh, I haven't used them on uh, tape anywhere. They're not on tape. Uh, I've rewritten some stuff, so I threw those out. They're still good jokes, but they don't fit anywhere that I'm using right now. Any topics I'm using them, they're really not fitting. Or there was another joke, kind of like that joke, that gets a better laugh. So he's back in AAA. Then he got the double A jokes that worked okay, but they really need to be reworked a little bit. I know there's something there. I just got to figure out what it is. They're your double A. Uh, it's almost like a, a, a rotation. It's like a, it's like it's like your batting lineup. You can be on stage and look at the crowd, and based on the, how the crowd looks, decide what jokes you might not want to tell. That well, night. yeah, you know, I've never been a dirty act. You know, I started out being pretty over the line. Then I had a wife and kids, and kids do a lot to change a person, you know. Your act? Yeah. Well, I yeah, because I got little, you know, I was really raw, you know. I was a single guy on the road. And like, what's something you would have told previously before you had kids but won't Well, tell there's that. a joke that I'm struggling with now, and I'm thinking, should I do this joke? Is it too over the line? Do I want my kids to see that joke? And then... What, I, what's the joke? I don't think it's that bad. Well, the joke is... Uh, uh, I remember first time I was in Vegas, it's decadent in Las Vegas, and I went down to 7-Eleven uh, to get something to eat, 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a bag of groceries, I'm walking up in the room, and there's a, one of them Vegas prostitutes standing out there in front of my door, and next thing I know, we in the room, she's naked, I'm naked, she's on top of me, I'm like, what the hell? I gotta call the police. So I grab the phone, and or no, I go, I gotta call the police, so I reach, you know, for a condom. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, it was, as these condoms are, it was, didn't fit, it's too tight, took 20 minutes to get the dag thing on. And uh, well, turns out I put on a Slim Jim wrapper. <laughs> Two weeks later, she gave birth to a little Smokey. <laughs> now, personally, 
It's comedy. I think right. it's funny. Do I want my kid hearing me going, eh, I put on a condom, you know, condom, you know? I don't know. Um, uh, apparently, you embellish less now than, I, I think I read somewhere you said you embellish stories less now than you did when you were uh, c coming up. And I'll give you an example, like we were talking to Aaron Rodgers today, who, uh, I mean, loves your comedy and was reciting uh, some of the mole uh, oh, yeah. you know, stories. Like, how, how do you decide what you want to embellish, embellish versus, like, real life? Oh, well, I, I want to make it outrageous. I'm yeah. not going to tell, uh, you know, when I was single, I made up everything. I made up ex-girlfriends. I pretend to, my ex-wife here a while back, you know, lie, 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 lie. It's just for the joke. Right. It's completely for the joke. Then I got married. Well, I can't do any ex-wife jokes because I've never been married. This is my, I'm talking about this is my first time I've ever been married, so that's all gone. Um, I don't want to talk about, really talk about, so I was with this girl a couple weeks ago, and we just, well, I can't do that. I'm married, and I don't want them to think I'm a dirtbag. I mean, it's, I know it's a did, character. Did you really cut all that right when yeah, you well, got Yeah, well, I know married? it's a character. Okay. I get it. Right. But they know I'm married in real life. Right. And so um, I have a very complicated career. <laughs> so, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to disrespect my wife by saying, well, you know, how's she going to feel, you know? So I quit doing that. Then I had kids. So now I can't make up kids anymore because now I got kids. They're giving me enough material on my own. That's the, the crazy thing about what I do. You know, I started out, what I started out doing was complete fantasy, complete character. Radio, theater of the mind, that's what it was. Then when I started doing it on stage, it went from theater of the mind to their scene, to realism. It's a character that they're seeing, but they're seeing it. I mean, it's to the point where people, and I like this, it's to the point where people don't know if it's real or if it's not real. Is that him? Is that a character? You know, it's like Stephen Colbert. When I used to watch Stephen Colbert, I didn't know what he was, I thought that was Stephen Colbert. Right. That was Stephen Colbert. But it wasn't Stephen Colbert. When you met Stephen Colbert, not doing the show or doing whatever that they hired him to do, he was normal. That's like me. People say, well, he's Larry the Cable Guy. Let him, he's become that character. I haven't become that character. Off camera, I'm Dan. Right. And everybody knows I'm Dan. It's just people see me on camera. Every time I'm on camera, that's what I'm doing when I'm off, because that's what I do. How did that character come to you? You know what? I worked on a bunch of characters. I was, uh, I was doing stuff for... Uh, Iris? Iris. Yes, Iris. Hello, Bob. There was a guy called Don Silverman in West Palm Beach, Florida on uh, WPBR. No, WJNO. Hello, everybody. It's Don Silverman, WJNO, 1230, West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, let's go to the phones. <laughs> And he was a, I met him, he used to come to the comedy corner and I fooled him for like two months. And he goes, let's go to the phone, let's go to uh, Iris in Boca. Hello, Don. Because <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard little old ladies from Boca. I used to do a bit about it. They all, everybody from Boca that's 70 and up all sound the same. Yes, my name's, uh, this is Iris and this is my husband, Hyman. Say hello, Hyman. Hello, my name's Hyman, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this is my sister, Rose. Rose, say hello to everyone. Hi, hello, this is, my name is, we're so happy to be a part of the whole thing, you know. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just you know, there's, yes, we, were, we have the, the, the potato salad here for everybody. Hi, you know, and they all sound, it's just like, everybody sounds the same. So I remember I used to call Don Silverman. Hello, hello, Don. Wonderful program, wonderful pro. 
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Iris. What's on your mind? I didn't really have as much of a question just to, other than to say that uh, we just love you. We listen to you all the time in Boca, and your, your just insights really mean a lot to us <laughs> down here. And I just, and I laughed yesterday. You did a thing with that man from Jupiter. And we laughed and laughed. And believe me, we're not laughers. We're not <laughs> laughers. And he was just like, well, thank you, Iris. All right, John, we'll be listening to your next segment. I'm very excited about the cooking segment. <laughs> You know? And I literally had him going. I would call every week. Hello, Don. This is Iris. We go to Iris again. Our old friend Iris. <laughs> you know. And I think he thought it was real. It was, and he loved it. You know. Because right. he here's this lady down there, chain smoking, right. listening. You know. And then finally one day I called up and I go, "Hello, Don. I want to comment on the senator." <laughs> right. <laughs> It made me laugh. And I went, hello, Don. I want to comment on the senator. And I kind of I went like this. He goes, is this Dan Whitney? And I went, what do you ever do you mean, Dan Whitney? I don't even know who he is. I want to talk about the senator. You know, then he got me. Right. Then I started laughing. I said, all right, Don, you got me. But I had you for about four months. And I hung up. Oh, my gosh. So funny. And it was more popular. When I started doing that on the radio in Tampa Bay, that was more popular. That was the first one. That was more popular than Larry the Cable Guy. Larry the Cable Guy came after Iris. There was Rose and Iris. Rose, Rose, Rose and Iris are you know, the same kind of D. One minute Rose would call, one minute Iris would call. It just depended on who I wanted to be. But they both sounded the same. And so... I couldn't, uh, I couldn't keep it up. It would hurt my voice, you know, and sometimes I'd do three-minute-long segments, and I just I couldn't do it anymore. And besides that, I didn't want to travel the country as an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> right. I couldn't do it on stage. So, yeah, that was the first character I did. Um, uh, Larry the Cable Guy came about. I went on stage at the Comedy Corner in West Palm Beach, and it was one of those nights where I was just trying stuff out. This would work. That was horrible. This would work. That joke sucked, but that joke was funny. And then one day I just said, hey, this guy ever come over to your house? And I kind of hiked my britches up. And, you know, I said, hey, did you order cable? And I did a little snicker. Well, somebody's ordered something. We got an old truck full of spool here. <laughs> and I did this cable installer guy. And I just kept adding to the story. I kept adding to these guys at the door, asking the lady questions, and it, was a, it turned into a five-minute deal. Great laughs. Um, so uh, my buddy called me up, and he said, dude, that cable guy, you got to call our radio station and do the cable guy, too. And so um, that's when I started doing uh, Rose and Larry the Cable Guy. And like I said, Rose, was more, uh, Rose and Iris and, uh, and uh, Larry the Cable Guy. And uh, Iris was actually uh, more popular to start off with. And then Larry the Cable Guy turned on the jets. I should make fun of old folks. I'll be old one day. Sus getting old, I'll tell you what. A lot of people might not realize is you don't have a southern accent. How easily can you go in and out I of it? I can get into it easily. And a lot, I'm like a, uh, I'm a linguist chameleon. I mean, I'll go to Wisconsin and I'll hang out with my cousin. Next thing you know, two days later, you know, I'm talking like I'm from, you know, Sorona, Wisconsin, because all my cousins talk like that. La Crasse, hey, let's go to La Crasse. You know, I just pick stuff up. Um, my dad had, my dad was a backwoods preacher. So my dad uh, had a little bit of Southern accent in him. He'd get to going and school became school. And so um, he had a little bit of that in him. His family, they're all from northeast Kansas, and they were all horse people and cow, cattle, you know, that kind of stuff. So they had a little twinge. But when I moved to Florida is when I got it because I was a country kid living in the country, loved livestock, and I gravitated to all the horse people, all the livestock people when I moved to Florida, out in Loxahatchee, Florida. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of country folks out in Loxahatchee. And I just gravitated to them, and uh, I went to college in Georgia. I went to a Baptist college in Georgia. Majored and in drama and speech. Drama right? and speech, yep. And uh, my roommate, one, was from Dalton, Georgia, super southern. My other one was from Beaumont, Texas. And 
I just was, I, they were roommates and I just started picking it up and then it just kind of solidified. It's, it's like, look, it's like George Lopez. You ever hang out with George Lopez? George Lopez talked to you like this. Well, you know, we went, and then the minute one of his buddies goes by, hey, hey, I thought he was, man, I thought, you know, I mean, he exaggerates what he knows, but he's, he talks, you know, he doesn't, he does, he's not that outrageously. Right. He doesn't do it outrageously. When he's with his friends, he is, brings it out at him. He's Mexican. He's gonna hang out with his Mexican buddies. That's how they're gonna talk. It's like me. I'm a country kid, I'm a cow kid, I'm a livestock kid, a horse guy. Right. I hang out with people that talk like that. So I picked it up, I picked it up in Georgia when I went to college. I'm able to talk like that. I can turn it on and turn it off anytime I want. It's not a big deal to me. You know, I hang out with my buddies. This, if my viewer, were my buddy Brad right now, he talks like this 24 hours a day. I would be talking to Brad like that. Neither one of us would think anything different about it. That's just how we do it. So uh, 1985, it's an open mic night. Yes. And I, I think your friends pressure you to get on stage. Yes. Take it from there. Well, this is crazy. They wanted me to go on stage. And, I, I, and that's what I wanted to do. I was driving a, driving a hotel van, always making the flight crews crap, crack up. You gotta be a comedian. You're funny, you should be a comedian. So, bell hop at where your mom was. There's a bell hop at, at the Hyatt Regency. In, uh, it was the Palm Hotel, the Hyatt Regency in West Palm Beach, it's called Hyatt Palm Beaches. Making a lot of good money too. So um, they dared me to go on stage. My buddy said, come on, you gotta go on stage. So my brother and sister came, all my friends came, and I went down there to get on stage. It was just a bar, they had a comedy night. And I went down there and uh, I was dressed in a pair of shorts, a buckwheat t-shirt with the sleeves cut out, and a uh, David Lee Roth type hat. That's back when David Lee Roth had uh, you know, his album out, you know, and uh, I went down there, had a cigar, and I had a boombox boom <laughs> with my own with my own applause and laughter on it. I mean, I was I was a fan of the old guys. I'm gonna do a joke. There's my rim shots. There's my I had all that there. Well, the funny story is, I went down there, and Todd always hates it when I tell this story. My buddy Todd Vidum is a fine actor. He's he's great. And this isn't a knock on Todd. We were all young comedians. And Todd's awesome. But we went down there and there's people in suits, clipboards with note cards. And I looked at my buddy John and I said, they got professional comedians there. I thought this was like an open mic night. Anybody can get up. He goes, yeah, I didn't know that either. He goes, well, that, that, he doesn't have no cars. I go, yeah, but I mean, they're outside and they're going over jokes. Oh, I don't want to go on stage. I'm not doing it. He's like, well, you got to do it. He goes, all your friends are here. I mean, we all came to see you. I said, John, I'm not going on stage, man. I'm going to make a fool out of myself. I mean, I was stressing out. I wanted to go. I wanted to get out of there. And he goes, ah, well, why don't we wait? Tell you what, you don't go up to like 7th. Why don't we wait and see how the first couple of guys are? If they're not good, what do you got to lose? And I'm like, all right, I'll wait and see how the first couple of guys are. <laughs> well, the first guy was this guy named Todd, <laughs> who was a friend, a good friend. Um, tanked. <laughs> I mean, just tanked. And I'm like, I'm funnier than that guy. He was one of the guys that's dressed up in the suit going over note cards. So that, I owe my career really to Todd because if Todd killed it, I'd have said, I'm out of here. I ain't doing it, but he didn't. I watched some stand up that you did, you know, when you went by uh, Dan Whitney and you were a lot younger. And the one thing I noticed was, I mean, you talked so much faster. Super fast, super now. fast. So. That got me hooked. And that's when I knew this is something that I really wanted to pursue. So you're doing stand-up, you're also 
calling into all these radio stations at its peak, like how many radio shows were you calling into, how often, and for how many years? At the peak of my calling into radio stations, I had, I'd say, trying to think of that notebook, I had 27 stations across the country. Um, some I would call three days a week. Some I would call one day a week. Some I'd call two days a week. Some I'd call, did I say five days a week already? No. Some I'd call five days a week. And it just depended. And I only got paid by four of those radio stations. Wow. Because I knew that if I could get on a radio station, I could sell out, I could sell tickets. So what I did was I had some dates where I was a middling, some headline acts, some middle acts. And I said, well, I'm gonna start booking myself in some of these markets as Larry the Cable Guy and just kind of see what happens. And that's when I would go in to do the comedy club and you'd have to go do the radio to promote it. And as soon as I'd walk in there, we'd go to the first break and the DJ would always go, hey, Dan, what's this thing you're doing on radio? Man, you're all over Bitboard. People are talking about this Cable Guy thing. I said, if you want me to do it, just call me up, man, and I'll do a commentary for you. And I can guarantee you, within two to three months, you will have people wanting to hear it. I was that confident. It was doing so good. And I said, you'll get a sponsor, and it'll pay for itself. If you want to pay me out of sponsor money, do that. The only thing I ask, if you have me on the show, just promote me at the comedy club. Just, just let people know I'm coming. So it was a win-win. And it would be a huge radio promotion. It would sell out the week. And that's, how, and that's how it started. Do you think the other comedians that you were working with at the time similarly wanted to have the same level of success with you and just didn't realize they had to be as dedicated? I can't speak yeah. for other comedians. I really can't. I do know that Jeff Foxworthy always taught me a valuable lesson in comedy if you want to become popular at it or at least have a chance at it and it's called show business for a reason. There's a show and there's a business. And there's a lot of people good at the show and they're bad at the business. So if you're really bad at the business, less people are gonna see the show because you don't know how to do the business end so people can come see the show. What did you know that made you good at the business? I knew how to, uh, reach out to people, to get up early, to make phone calls, to um, uh, uh, get your name out there, to show up and do things that cost you money to do. The whole reason I'm on the blue collar, that I got on the blue collar comedy tour was I had been on the road forever doing Larry the Cable Guy and it was going great. And I finally had a weekend off for the first time in a month and a half. Um, my manager at the time called me up and said, hey, I know you just got home, but there's a thing that Foxworthy's doing with Andy Griffith and Bill Engball. And I'd heard about this blue collar tour. It just started. They'd only done maybe 12 shows. Uh, but they got, a, got rid of the, uh, one of the guys. He wasn't, they didn't think he was blue collar enough. He's a super nice guy. They just didn't think he was blue collar enough. And it wasn't meshing. So they got rid of him. They were looking for uh, one more guy, but I didn't know this. Here's, here's what she said to me. Here's the bad news. It doesn't pay anything because they don't have a budget. You're the last guy. Doesn't No airfare, but they'll get your room for the night. And I'm like, well, I want to see Jeff. Jeff and I are friends. I ain't seen Jeff in a while. He's been out on the road a bunch. But the cool thing is it's at the Ryman Auditorium. I've never worked the Ryman. I would love to work the Ryman. You work the Ryman, there might be somebody in the audience that can see you because that's Nashville. So I went up there not to see Jeff and to work the Ryman because it was the mother church country music, you know. Flew up to Nashville, went on stage and killed it. I mean, killed it. Well, three weeks later, I got the call. Jeff wants you to come up and the guys want to see you. They want to see if you'll work out with the blue collar tour. We think you'll fit real, real good with this whole thing. 
And that's when it all came together. That's when the show and the business, you know, I wasn't getting paid, but from four radio stations, instead of going out after comedy clubs, that's where I say show business. 93, I started doing the radio, 92, 93. Um, and here it is, 1999, 98, 99, six years later. So six years of phone calls, five days a week, only getting paid for, at the time, from three stations then. Um, it all culminated to that one night in Nashville. And if I wasn't good at the business and if I didn't care and if I didn't pick up the phone and make phone calls, I would go to bed at three o'clock in the morning at home and I would wake up at 6.15. I mean, for years, I got four hours of sleep, four and a half hours of sleep for years. But it all culminated into something that, I'm, that it turns out to be what it is. So, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing how that works. How did the blue collar comedy tour change your life? Well, I mean, it's, it went, it took me from doing comedy clubs to where people, I was rocking the comedy clubs, but I'm doing, you know, 300 a night, I'm doing seven shows. So I'm doing 2,100 people, seven shows, five days, which was awesome. I loved it. I went from doing 2,100 people in seven, and, and, and for a week to uh, 14,000 a night. <laughs> So now I'm doing, uh, now I'm going from uh, 2,100 a week to, uh, to uh, 42,000 a weekend. And that's what did it. How well, if at all, do you recall the first time you got a really big paycheck for your work? Oh, <laughs> <clears throat> well, when we were just uh, curtain jerkers on there, we were only making, uh, we weren't, you know, we were just pulling in good money, you know, better, you know, most people, but Jeff and Bill were doing all that. But I think the first big check I got, I think, was uh, I got where they started, they wanted me to start going out into some theaters. And uh, they told me, well, we have to do a theater and it's going to pay you this for the week. And I'm like, ah, really? Holy mackerel. Hey, can I get a jet? Can I fly to it in a jet? Because I always wanted to fly in a jet, you know, because Jeff always flew to his gigs in a jet. So I'm thinking, hmm, I can avoid the airport. How much would a little Learjet cost? Can I? Because I didn't care. I'd never made that much money in my life. Right. So I'm thinking, well, if the Learjet's half of that, dude, I'm making good <laughs> money and I'm flying a Learjet. Right. You know what I mean? Not thinking, well, fly Delta like you normally do, and then you get all that. Right. You know, it wasn't, but, uh, I didn't, I flew regular, but, um, and it was like amazing. I'm thinking, wow, you can actually make this much money in comedy? Well, three years after I thought that, I was making 15 times what they were offered. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, it's unbelievable when you do, when you start hitting a stride and you start being successful in the entertainment business, how you, how you th get to a level and you're like king of the world. And then you don't realize, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. There's another level right there. And right below that's another level. And right, you're still at this level. Even though you think you're at a good level, there's three more levels, four more levels. And why did you never think that all of the success that you've had would ever come to you? Oh, never in a million years. Like, no. why not? I got to tell you, well, I just... I, I don't know. You know, you always look at people. You know, I mean, I wasn't sure if it would or not. Here was my goal. I always thought if it happens, it happens. Here's what I want to do. I want to do what I enjoy doing for a living and make money at it. I want to be able to make, and maybe if I get married and have a family, I can just make enough to support my family and this is what I do. That's what I thought. I mean, when I got into the comedy business, I had a figure in my head. Before I quit my job at the hotel, which I never, by the way, have officially quit, the Hyatt Regency gave me a leave of absence to pursue my dreams. And they said, if it doesn't work out, you always got a job with us. That's what they told me. So I just never went back. And you still have the name tag, don't you? I still got the name tag. In case they might need a bellhop for a weekend, I'm there. But, uh, um, uh, but I had a figure in my head, and I said, if I can make X amount of money a year, I can live on that. I'm a happy guy. 
I will be. I've never been, you know, I've never been one of those guys where money's, money, you want to take care of your bills. But, you know, that kind of stuff, I just want to take care of my bills. I never really set out to be this huge star because it's so rare. I mean, when you go into something, how many comedians are there? How many can you count on your hand that can sell out uh, arenas and a stadium or do movies? Right. It's a handful. So getting into it, you're already thinking, well, my odds are pretty slim. I just want to be funny. I want to be considered really funny, be able to have an audience that wants to come see me. But if I can, if I can kick back every year and I can have 25 comedy clubs want to hire me because they like me and I, have, I can sell some tickets, I'm happy. I'm happy doing that. Fortunately for me, it just... <laughs> spun out of control and went really crazy, you know? The Pixar movie, Cars. I, I read somewhere you said that was your biggest break. Um, why? Well, uh, it's a Pixar movie. I mean, I'm a comedian, I'm working in comedy clubs, and I'm doing well, you know? I remember getting the letter in 2002 from them. Um, but I was doing good, I was on the Blue Collar Tour. Uh, but this, man, this is a huge deal. This is Pixar. You know, and I mean, they get major movie stars to do voices for them. So it was funny when I got that. Um, I remember coming home to my house and my Maggie goes, uh, hey, um, uh, did you check your fax machine? I said, no, I. She goes, hey, we got a really cool offer, but we have to know if you want to do it or not. I think you would love to do it. I said, what is it? She goes, well, just go look at it. You call me, let me know what you think. And Maggie being your manager agent. Well, she's my manager now, but she was working for my other manager at the okay. time. So I went in there and it says, uh, hey, we're fans of your work. We think you're hilarious, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're, well, it said, uh, we at Pixar, we have a movie coming out called Cars. Uh, it explained what the movie is. And it says, uh, we're, uh, we would love to offer you the part of uh, Zeb, our small town tow truck. At the time it was Zeb, when he made her. John changed it to Mater when he went to Charlotte and the king of the infield was this guy, that was, they called him Mater, that was his nickname. And so John we, Lasseter, the Pixar head. Yeah, yep. so John Lasseter changed his tow truck from Zeb to Mater for that guy. He told that guy he'd name his tow truck. That's, John's a great guy, so that's what he did for that guy. And, and it says, we're prepared to offer you. I said, wow, that's cool. I said, well, when would I, I said, prepared to offer me. I go, what does this mean? You know, I didn't know what it's talking about. When do I, do I, I got an audition, obviously. It's a Pixar movie. So I called her back and I go, Maggie, I go, this is unbelievable. Uh, but when do I, I mean, when do I got, I got to do airfare? And she goes, no, you got the part. I go, I got, I got the, Really? And I just, I started crying. I was so excited. Oh, I'm starting to cry now thinking about it. It's the greatest thing ever happened to me. I love Pixar so much. What, but, what, what about it made you so emotional? It's, it was just amazing. I mean, Pixar has been so good to me. Um, I think about that moment. <laughs> Sorry. It That's just fine. makes me happy. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> this sucks. Well, you, you, it's just everything, everything you worked for. You know, <laughs> it still makes me so happy. <laughs> I get happy and I get emotional. I'm a very emotional guy. There's why this makes me happy. It's, it's, it's an emotional thing when I talk about it because I worked so hard. You know, I did uh, all these call-ins and I did this and I was on the road and I, and I, and I never got to do stuff other people got to do because I was on the road. And then all of a sudden there's this letter from Pixar and they gave me the part. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? Right. Just made me happy. And I think about it now. That's one of the turning points of my career. That's why I think about it. Uh, that's why I always get kind of crazy happiness because it literally changed my life. And the fact that... Um, and the fact that... Um, it introduces me to a whole new audience, you know? It's really funny when I got the part, because it was like, 
I went out there and John Lasseter came up to me, gave me a big hug, and he goes, man, you defend yourself so funny, I bet you, blah, 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 you know? And so we went in there and uh, I got the script, and it's about like this, you know? And uh, he sat there in the thing and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, okay, this is, I mean, look, he goes, I hired you because you're funny and, you know, uh, this is gonna be awesome. I'm so happy that you're my tow truck and, and basically, I'll just read the things. We'll do this. We might do a line 10 times. Don't think you're doing bad. I just want to get, I like different versions of it. So I might do it three times. I might do it 15 times. But don't you, you know, just. So he goes, this is the scene where Mater just shows up on the screen. And he says, hello. So I look at the script. And I, you know, I'm trying to think, well, do I need to, you know, I'm trying to think, how am I going to do this? This is the first time I've seen this line, right. <laughs> you know? So I was just me. I wasn't trying to be anybody but me on stuff. This is me. And I remember looking at it, and I just, I just went, hey, my name's Mater, like Tom Mater, without the tub. And I look, and John Lasseter goes, that's it. That's my tow truck. Oh, man. Give me a couple more. I think I got it, but give me a couple more. And I did like three more, and he goes, oh, this is great. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> and right then, I'm like going, so I'm loosening up a little bit, you know? And then... Uh, and it was originally supposed to be a minor part yes, later, and it yes. turned into a major Yes, and then, oh, my gosh, role, yeah. Obviously. So then we, so then we get to, uh, we get to uh, uh, a couple more lines. So that's when I started adding, well, dad gums. That's when I started adding dad gums and gator duns. And I mean, now I'm really comfortable because he's loving it and it's just flying. Well, I go back to the house and uh, I don't hear from Pixar for seven, six months, seven months. I call my manager and I go, what happened to that cartoon we were doing, man? It was, I mean, I haven't heard anything from him. Did they not like it? And he goes, yeah, it has been a while, hasn't it? And I go, yeah, I mean, I know it takes a while, but you'd think they would have said something. Right. And he goes, well, let me call and see. He calls me back and uh, he says, uh, they checked this out. He goes, no, they loved it. He goes, they're just, they're rewriting it for put more Mater in it. I go, really? Yeah, they love Mater. And then I went, I went back out there. John told me, he says, I got to tell you, he goes, um, when this was started out as just a kind of a, but man, we just love this character. We love what you did to the character. I mean, it's, it's literally one of my favorite characters of any movie that we've done. He goes, so we're adding, we just, we're adding more to it because uh, the animators love animating Mater. He's so precious. Everybody just thinks he's the sweetest little truck. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. So they, they just wrote more parts in, and it was great. So there you go. Pawnee City, Nebraska, um, eight miles uh, north of the Kansas border, I think population of a little more than a thousand. How was going to school with your dad as principal? Uh, you know what? It was okay. My dad, my dad was a disciplinarian, but my dad was cool. He was a good dad. And he, I, he was a great principal. All the kids loved him. He was an elementary principal. It did stink though when I got like, they, we used to have a thing in our school called tallies. And if you got so many tallies, you got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Of course, elementary principals kids got a lot of. <laughs> in what ways was he strict? Uh, well, he was, uh, you know, he was, his dad was pretty tough on him. He's old school, you know? And, yep. and I asked that too, because in reading about you, it seemed like there was like just more there to, you, you know, that relationship. Like he, he was really strict and. Well, he was strict in some things and not strict in other things. You know, I'm, I, he's just like, I would say he was probably, um, he was old school. You know, you do something, you get spanked, taking the belt off, he's gonna spank you. You know, you didn't cross him. He was tough. So I was, it only took one time for me to do something I shouldn't do, and that was it. And I knew not to do it again. Is there one time that sticks out the most when you misbehaved and he really... Report card day. <laughs> Report card day hammered me. You know, but... What, what, what would happen? Well, you, you, you get flipping spanked, punched, <laughs> you name it, you know. It's 
spanked, punched. You know, he was a human being. I got no ill will toward him. He's dead now, and it is what it is. You know, it didn't make turn me into a bad person. Right. Sometimes I deserve, let me tell you, sometimes I deserve to get spanked. You know, sometimes I deserve to smack across the head. You know, I was a stupid kid sometimes. Did he overdo it sometimes? I think so. I wouldn't treat my kids the way my dad treated me. Um, but I didn't get in a lot of trouble when I was a kid. I stayed out of trouble because I was scared of my dad and I knew what would happen if I got in trouble. So, you know, a lot of people blame this or blame that. I don't blame that on anything, you know. People are human beings. Human beings are gonna be human beings. My dad made a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. So it is what it is. Do you think that had any impact on you as you were yeah, I think it up. made me funny. I think it made me way fam it helped it made me have good timing. W I was why? Well, if my dad came home and it was report card day and my brother was in trouble and I was in trouble and it was gonna be tense, I always knew when to pop a joke out and make make him laugh. I could make my dad laugh. So I knew when to, I knew when to say something and I knew when to not say something. I knew when to tell a joke and I knew that's how I'm always got good timing. I know when to tell a joke. I know when it's appropriate to tell a joke. I know when I should tell a joke. <laughs> he taught me that pretty good. Describe what it was like growing up on basically a pig farm. Yeah, you know, I raised, you know, it's really crazy. I love that life, you know. I, I, um, I, the guy that ran the sale barn was like my adopted grandpa and I'd go to the sales I remember waiting for Thursday. I couldn't wait for that little the class to get out when I was a kid. And I'd ran home and I grabbed my, my hog stick, my bull whip, and I ran across to the sale barn and I started loading and unloading cattle trucks and hog trucks. I loved it. It was my life. How do you go about buying it as a kid three pigs and discreetly raising them in your bedroom closet? <laughs> my mom tell you that? Yeah. I got into raising hogs because Kenny, who was my adopted grandpa, I call him, I went with him to a sale like I always did, and he bought me three little baby feeder pigs. I mean, they were little. And I had to bottle feed them. And I didn't have a place to put them. So I snuck them into the closet. And I put them in the closet and I gave them some water. <laughs> and, and I would get a bottle, I get the sale barn, I get the little bottle thing, and I walk in there and I'd feed my pigs. And then my mom found out they were in the closet, and I had to move them, so we ended up making a place for them in the barn, you know. But that got me started, and I was the only, I was probably the only nine year old, eight or nine year old in Pawnee City, Nebraska, or anywhere in Nebraska for that matter, that already had a bank account of about 3,200 bucks because I was going over to the sale barn and I would buy four. I would sell some. I would buy this many. I would sell some. And your parents were cool with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. I had a place made for them in the whole deal. It got to the point where I was buying 35 head, 40 head, you know, loading them up on a truck. And oh, yeah, I had a whole thing going. Yeah. And, and, and uh, how old were you then? Well, when I was buying that many, Probably ten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> ten or eleven. Yeah. But I could do the whole thing. I didn't understand. I, I'd sit there, and uh, the auctioneer'd come on there, and hey, what have you been for? Now, hand. I would have been that. Hey, what have been that? What have been that? What have been that? What have been that? And I'm a little kid. I'm like going like this. Hip, hip. I'd be like, hip. You know, I knew my limits. Candy trusted me. If he thought I was going too much, he'd be in the ring and he'd look at me and go, shake his head at me. And that's, man, I loved it. I did that for, I loved it. Explain what hip dysplasia is. Hip dysplasia is when someone's hip is born out of, your, your, your hip is out of socket. So when you're born, it's not fully formed. My little boy had hip dysplasia when he was born. It's not a life-threatening disease. It's a, it can be crippling. You, you have to have hip surgery later on in life. You might have to have hip surgery in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. 
his hip, when he was born, here was his socket, here was his ball, right here, kind of like this. So basically, that thing has to grow like this and grow in place. Well, if it's up here, it's kind of hard to do. So they have to, they put him in a harness so that his, his, it was his, his legs were positioned in a way that that ball can grow into there. When you found that out, how did your research lead you to the Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital? Well, we didn't, we were kind of worried about it, you know, because you want a healthy baby and he was such a cute kid. And then when they told us he was having a problem with his hip, we're thinking, oh, that stinks. And the thing is, we went to a doctor and you went on the internet, there's nothing on it. You can find a website here and a website there. You find a lot of stuff about dogs and their hips, but you're not a lot about humans and their hips. Well, this guy didn't know much about it. We sent a guy, they sent us to a guy in Omaha and he was like, yeah, you know, this is something that they're, you know, he just kind of hemmed, hemmed and hawed. Basically, well, we can do one of two things. We can have surgery on him now and repair that hip or just let it grow the way it grows. And probably when he gets older in his 40s, he's probably going to have to have a hip surgery. But there's not really, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. So there's, you're just trying to struggle and trying to find information. And then finally my wife said, well, is, is there anybody that knows who knows about this? And he recommended this. Well, there's a guy in Orlando at the uh, orthopedics branch of Arnold Palmer. And he's one of the best in the business at this hip stuff. You might want to give him a call and see. If... So we called Chad Price, Dr. Price. And Chad uh, told us, you know, bring him down here. I have... I've kind of adjusted the Pavlik harness and I've kind of done some stuff to it. And I've, and I've done some research about swaddling kids and, and and I think that it'll work. He told us what to do with the harness and he adjusted this and that. And by gosh, a year later, he just, my boy just had his x-ray here a month ago, completely cured. We never have to go back again. His hip is completely Cured. The hardest part, outside of the lack of information, for you and your wife of going through that whole process. Would well, be yeah, like, because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know, you don't know if you're going to have to have this little boy have an operation already. People that have this, they struggle with how do you get information. So that's what we decided to do with Chad. We wanted to form the International Hip Dysplasia Institute, and basically. It's a place that people can go and hear other people's stories so that you're not alone, so that you know what this is, that it can be helped, that there's doctors that are all trained in the same way of approaching this problem. And it's so now when you go on the internet and you want to know about hip dysplasia, it takes you to the Interna International Hip Dysplasia Institute right. at the Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital. And it was really cool because I was a fan of Arnold Palmer. I love golf. Right. And uh, it was an honor to be able to be a part of Arnold Palmer's hospital and put it in his hospital. And the Wyatt Whitney. It's the Wyatt Whitney Hip Dysplasia Institute. We've done a lot of donations and name we always you. name it after other people. But we thought that this would be pretty awesome um, to name it after our kid because if Wyatt didn't have the hip dysplasia problem, this would have never happened. The foundation probably wouldn't even started. So it's the Wyatt Whitney International and, Hip Dysplasia. And I, I mean, you donated the fortune, you donated $5 million to make that happen. You, Don't remind uh, me. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> I mean, donated another million to uh, That's childhood That's on top advocacy. of the five. Right, and then uh, another one plus million to a rehabilitation hospital, you know, among uh, right. uh, uh, other things. So, I, I mean, what um, of all the philanthropy that you've done, what would you say you're most proud of? All of it. I don't put one above the other. Uh, they're all, all people have needs, and if we're able to do it, we should do it. You know, we should, I mean, we should do it. I mean, you don't have to do it. I'm not going to make you do it, but you should. I mean, if you're any kind of a person inside, you should want to be able to do stuff like that. So we do a lot of this stuff just because it's fun, it's fun to do.
I'll be honest, it's fun to do. So. Uh, and now you have your own celebrity golf event. Yeah, we got it. You know what? We have one, we have one celebrity golf event a year, um, uh, uh, and it goes into the Gitter Dunn Foundation. And the Gitter Dunn Foundation, we we get letters from all over the place, and so we pick ten to twelve organizations to give to. We'll have a main gift, so the main thing will go here. And then uh, 11 other organizations, it'll get divided up. It can be whatever. It can be 10 grand here, five grand there, 25 grand there, 17 grand there. But you know what? Even the smallest donation is helping somebody, you know? And that's what it's all about. Why did you used to call the Omaha Funny Bone to listen to Nebraska game? Um, I'm a huge Nebraska Cornhusker fan. I grew up. Of course, in Nebraska, I was born there. And from the minute I could even know what football was, Nebraska was one of the greatest football teams of all time. There was not a time that I was not alive. Nebraska didn't win nine to 11 to nine games a year and go to a New Year's Day bowl game or a major bowl game. We were ranked in the top 15 every year since I've been alive from 19 that I can remember. So figure from 1970, uh, it's probably when I started really, because we were the national champs. Nebraska, was, 1971, we were national champs. Um, 1970, uh, we were close. But from that time, from the time I was seven, eight years old, till the time I was, so from, you figure from 1970 to 2002. 2002 was the first losing season we were seven and seven we lost seven we lost more games in one season than we did for the first six years of the 90s <laughs> and it was devastating but uh, what was it yeah. yeah but i'll just always remember nebraska that's what they do they win and so i'm a diehard i was born and raised there obviously so i'm a diehard nebraska fan right as you can see and uh, i used to before the internet when I lived in Florida, I didn't get the Nebraska games anymore. So when I started doing stand-up, Nebraska had a game. I'm not getting it on cable here and where I'm at. So I would call the Funny Bone in Omaha, and I would say, hey, can, can I listen to the game? I got to hear the game. I don't know how to hear the game. And Colleen says, well, you want, you want to listen to it on the phone? I'll put the phone down by the radio. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, Colleen, I would love that. She goes, yeah, I don't care. So the game started. Colleen would put the phone by the radio, and then she would just use her other lines. And every now and then she'd go, you still there? i go, Colleen, put it down. It's third down. <laughs> all right, all right. So you'd put it down. And I would listen. I probably listened to, I probably listened to 10 games through the funny bone tel <laughs> uh, telephone. How true is it that you would schedule your tour dates around Nebraska home All football games? All the time. Games? I do not work when Nebraska plays a home game, so I can go to the game. However, this year, I think they did schedule one. I'm going to miss one, but it's Northern Illinois, so I think I'll be all right. right. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> have, how many home games do you think you've missed over the years? Well, since I got my sweet box, none. When did you get the sweet box? I uh, got the sweet box, I think, in 2004. Five. Okay. So 12 years, 11 years, I've missed one home game uh, till this year, but it's Northern Illinois. So. In high school, you played JV football in Nebraska, varsity football when you went to Florida. How were you as a football player? Not very good. I love football, and I'm not bad at it. I was never big enough. I was always too fat, too. I, was, I get in a three-point stance. I didn't, I, I get, if I'm going to get in a three-point stance, you better snap it right away. I, none of this long <laughs> count BS, because I can't sit on a three-point stance for a long count. I'll come in for a quick snap, but uh, other than that. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, you give yourself a hard time about being an athlete, but you had a mid-90s fastball as yes. a baseball player I, in college. Yeah, I was a baseball fanatic. I still am a baseball fanatic. And, and nobody fanatic. really knows anything about that. You always hear the football yeah. in Nebraska. Stuff, if I but. knew that I had that much, if I knew I had talent for baseball, I might have went to a different college and tried to play baseball at a baseball college. But I didn't so? know. I was always timid when it came to athletics. I knew I was good in certain things, 
but I got intimidated by guys that thought they were good. Did you give consideration to really trying to pursue the baseball thing professionally? Ed? No, I didn't because I started doing stand-up and it kind of took precedent over the baseball. Okay. But um, I love baseball and I was good at it. And that's the one thing I can say I was good at that I want to brag about. I never missed a scoop. I could scoop with the bat, but what I didn't know I could do is throw. I mean, I knew I could throw, but I didn't, I never ever thought I would be a pitcher. But I remember one time in college, I got the, I got the cojones to go out for the baseball team. I couldn't hit very good, but I was a pretty good fielder. I just wanted to give it a shot. I went out for the baseball team, and I was the only left-handed guy on the team. It was a small Christian college in Georgia. I started, and I, also was, I came out in the bullpen almost every other game. How'd you do? I didn't do too bad. My first year I did bad because I didn't know how to pitch. I was more concerned with throwing strikes than anything else. The next year I played South DeKalb Community College, and I don't remember the score, but I do remember I held them to two hits over seven innings and struck out. It wasn't eight. I, I think I struck out seven. But I struck out a ton of them. But I only gave up two hits. And, uh, and this is verified by my outfielder and my third baseman. You can call them up. Dave Palmer and Daryl Cobb is my third baseman. Warren Wilson College in Warren Wilson, North Carolina. I hit 95 on the radar gun in the fifth inning. Clocked. Clocked. You want to hear a funny story? Let me just say this. Okay. So I tell the coach at Nebraska at the time, he's not there anymore, but I tell the coach <clears throat> before he went to another school, this is about four years ago, five years ago. I'm telling him this story. You, you think you can still hit that? I said, no. I said, I bet I'd still throw hard because we get these, when we're on tour, we play pitch and stuff, and I still throw pretty hard. What do you think you'd hit? I said, I bet I can still throw high 70s. No, man, you're almost 50. I said, I guarantee you, we are just throwing, so I'm doing that, right? Well, come down and throw bat practice and take some bat practice with the, with the Huskers. So I went down, it was fun. I took bat practice with the Huskers. All of a sudden he goes like this, come on, let's get you on the gun. <laughs> I go, oh, man, I ain't ready. <laughs> I'm not even like, I got these shoes, I, I don't even have spikes on. I just came down and hit some balls. You know, I was hitting. Well, let me warm up. So, I, oh man, so, you know, I warm up a couple and I warmed up about five or six, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm kind of buzzing them in. All right, I'm ready. So, hit the, right, I go, oh man, that's pretty good, right? I go, that's free, that's, that's gotta be, how, what was it? 52. <laughs> 52? Get out of here. Well, hold on, I'm not, hold on, let me just, uh, I says, all right. And I'm not kidding, I put everything I had in there. I tweak my, I rotate, I mean, it hurt, you know. You know how you, all your blood rushes, you know? but I fired it. It was a nice, and it was a strike, and it popped. The dust came off the mitt, and I'm like going, Mikey, I'm telling you, that's got to be high 60s, at least. 52! <laughs> I said, all right, get out of here, I'm done. So my baseball career is over with. But back in the day, I was somebody. The 2017 at t Pebble Beach Pro-Am was filled with plenty of celebrities. Along with Whitney, fans got up close with the likes of Bill Murray, Peyton Manning, Justin Timberlake, Aaron Rodgers, and Wayne Gretzky. We come out here and we have fun, we enjoy it. A lot of money gets raised for charities, and so for us to be a small part of that, that's why we come. On the first day of tournament play, we met Whitney for breakfast at 6 a.m. before heading to the practice range. It's a good way to good way to spend an afternoon right. and uh, get out and see the scenery. My wife's getting into golf because that gives us something to do together and have a good time doing together. So yeah, I, I really like it. There was a time when uh, I flipping hated it. We'd go on the bus and my buddy would be watching the U.S. Open and I'd be like, flip the football games on, dude. You're watching, right. you turn that garbage off. Now, it's the other way around. I mean, I can go and go. I can play golf all day long. Oh! How much time do you think you spend in an average week playing? 
in the summertime. I play golf. Uh, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, by the way, I play today. But I play golf probably four days a week because I love golf. Golf is so much fun. And this is coming from a guy, I want to tell everybody that doesn't like golf. This is coming from a guy that despises golf. I hated golf. I could have cared less about golf. Golf is so relaxing. It's fun. You meet so many fun people. I love it. So, how do you get to know Dan? Um, I met him at uh, Tahoe a number of times now. Uh, just kind of went up to him the first time. I've been a fan of uh, the Blue Collar Comedy Tour since I was younger. I'm not going to say a kid to date him too much, but. Really? Uh, but yeah, I've been a big fan for a long time. I remember getting CDs and wearing those things out. And, uh, and he's a great entertainer. What's your favorite part of his comedy? Uh, I love his interaction with the crowd. I mean, he. He doesn't have the uh, kind of the rabbit ears where he hears everything, but he will comment back and forth on uh, some of the comments from the crowd. And he's got a, you know, an interesting demographic. I think going to some of his shows, uh, so he says he's got some funny jokes, man. But I like the interaction he has with the crowd. You have a favorite joke? Uh, <laughs> he had a set where he was talking about uh, people being covered with moles. Um, starting with his sister. That was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> it was kind of the joke. My sister is covered in moles. Right, or, the, or yeah. his mom has yeah. so many moles and the kids use it as a climbing <laughs> wall or something like that. Yeah. How's the uh, playing with them? It's fun. You know, we played a practice round a couple years ago in Tahoe and uh, he was kind of bummed out because he was coming off a lot of really good rounds. He said back home he was shooting, you know, low 80s, high 70s. And uh, there's something about you know, be in this environment that uh, gets you nervous. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times you've been in front of a crowd. Uh, it, when you're out of your element, it's different. But uh, we had you know, we had some fun playing around, and he's just a really fun guy to be around. So, uh, how did you guys first meet? Um, golf tournament, you know. Uh, he and I uh, do a lot of charity golf events together, and. Uh, so we got to be good friends over the years from playing in these uh, kind of fun events. So that's how we became friends. How, how's, uh, how does he play? You know what? He's got the same attitude I have. We come out here and we have fun. We enjoy it. We're both not very good. Uh, but that's not why we're here. We're not here to become professional golfers. Uh, we're here to mix and mingle, have fun with everyone. And more importantly, that at these events, uh, a lot of money gets raised for charities, and so for us to be a small part of that, that's why we come. What do you like about him? Oh, he's just, what you see is what you get. He's just very uh, uh, real. Um, I think that in life, uh, if you can be yourself, uh, you're at ease and you're at peace of mind, and he's just genuinely a really nice man, and uh, he's good to everyone. Um, so, I mean, you first played in Tahoe and Pebble Beach yep. with Larry the Cable Guy. What yeah. do you think of him? His gallery is a lot bigger than mine. I know that. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Not yeah. out in Pebble <laughs> Beach. I mean, you're the. You know what? He. Uh, you know, I haven't been around him. The thing I think I appreciate a lot is, is how uh, how good he is with the fans at all these events. And then uh, the thing I just noticed from afar how how good the golf games gradually got. You know, I remember uh, I felt like it was five years ago. Um, to now, he's playing at a much different level and kind of worked on his game a little bit, but still has a ton of fun out here with the fans. 